Hi, everyone. Welcome to the U.S. Center. Uh, before we get started with this afternoon's event, uh, Approaches for Preparedness for Building and Resilience, Lessons from Hurricane Sandy, we're going to show a short video produced by NOAA uh, with testimonials from uh, people that were actually affected by Hurricane Sandy. So we're going to start out with that. Thank you. Just a year ago, uh, I finished culinary school and I was looking for a business opportunity. And uh, you know, we, my wife and I loved Panini Bay Restaurant, and we were just online one day and saw it for sale. So uh, last June uh, 19th, uh, we closed on our what we thought was our dream uh, location. We had a, a restaurant off the shore, and we lived in the apartment above, uh, and you were right on the water in Tuckerton. The storm left more than 40 people dead in the United States. Millions are still without power and towns remain flooded. Climate change models show forecasted for exponential sea level rise into the future, severe storms at high intensities, flash flooding, our communities need to be prepared for this. We hope to provide them great information to help them be prepared. Superstorm Sandy is one eye-opener for communities. When we returned after the storm, everything had been completely flooded. Everything on the waterfront side had been destroyed, torn off, everything under the house destroyed. I have a wife and two young children, a three-year-old and an infant. And uh, <laughs> it's hard to talk about. We want them to grow up here on the water, but you know the storm really shook things up. I right now am facing a struggle between teaching people how to be more resilient and think about the future while knowing that emotionally they're dealing with the here and now and what happened to them after the storm. The first reaction was just to rebuild uh, as quickly as possible. But then as you know, the week started to go by, we heard about the base flood elevations were going to change. And then they had links to what the advisory base flood elevation is on the FEMA website. You know, we based some of our building decisions on that. When we elevated, it was the 11 feet plus 3. So it took some extra time. That's how we ended up missing this whole summer season. But I think in the long run, we're building in such a way that hopefully it'll last for 20 years, 25 years at least. And this is the entrance. Ivor is the perfect example of someone that has made a decision in a more resilient way, thinking about 20, 30 years into the future. After Superstorm Sandy went through, we had been working on a website called the New Jersey Flood Mapper, which shows future inundation due to sea level rise. Take this and slide it, it starts showing you what, at one foot of rise. At one foot? Yeah. The New Jersey Flood Mapper, we think, is a very powerful tool for helping people think about the future, whereas FEMA floodplain maps sort of talk about past conditions, our maps look into the future. Yeah, Green Street under? When I was working with Ivor, it was obvious that he had not heard about sea level rise yet, that that was a new concept to him. For now we need a boat to get down the street. That's crazy. And so this is where the water would be at a high tide level. And so that's why we know people should be concerned about this. The sea level rise is totally, totally new to me. A lot of what you read, they say six inches by 2050 or a few inches. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of shocking. If you're thinking about rebuilding or you're a town official thinking about the future of your town and you don't want to just look in the rear view mirror all the time, you sort of want to look ahead, we think our mapping tool provides that window into the future and provides good science-based information to help them make an informed decision. It's shocking that, you know, the sea level rise is one foot and the land we're on now is underwater at high tide. It's uh, very informative. And a little scary. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're doing the right thing in terms of rebuilding 
for the future. We didn't want to do anything too short term and we're gonna have a beautiful restaurant that hopefully will you know, be very successful. We know that communities, counties, and even the state at this point are using sea level rise data when thinking about future hazards and ways to mitigate for those future hazards. So that makes my job feel important and it makes me feel like we're doing something that's making a difference. to Noah for uh, pulling those uh, very important testimonials together. And again, I just want to welcome you all to the U.S. Center. Thank you for joining us uh, for this event on approaches for preparedness, uh, rebuilding, and resilience lessons from Hurricane Sandy. Uh, we have uh, some distinguished presenters to speak to you today uh, from the perspectives of the U.S. government, from local governments in the U.S., and then we also have uh, some international perspectives um, on, on these lessons from Hurricane Sandy. Um, just to begin, I want to also welcome our uh, online audience. Thanks for tuning in, and be sure to hashtag AskUSCenter if you have any questions. Uh, for others, if you could just hold your questions to the end, we'll, we'll save some time for some Q&A. So to start out, I'd like to invite Chair Sutley to the podium and our other presenters uh, up on stage, and I'll give them a brief introduction. It's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Chair Nancy Sutley, who is Chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality and she is the principal environmental policy advisor to the president. She helps to develop and coordinate the administration's environmental and energy policies and initiatives. And uh, one accomplishment under her leadership is that uh, the US federal government has created the first ever federal agency climate change resilience plans. Uh, also with us today, we have, um, excuse me, We have Matthew Rodriguez, the California Secretary for Environmental Protection, and he was appointed the California Secretary for Environmental Protection in July 2011. He oversees the activities of six boards, departments, and offices within the agency, including the California Air Resources Board, which many of us have heard of, and the State Water Resources Control Board. Also today, we'll hear from um, Josh Sawaslak, who should be joining us uh, via the uh, web. And he is the senior advisor to the Secretary for Infrastructure, Resilience at, at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Finally, we'll hear from Julie Arihi, who is a country representative with the Red Cross uh, in Uganda. She is uh, uh, charged with the task of creating games. Um, her, let's see, and she brings uh, experience from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute uh, where she and received her master's in climate and society from Columbia University. Okay, Chair Sutton. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you uh, for joining us here today at the U.S. Center to discuss some of the lessons that we've learned in the U.S. Uh, over the past year uh, when it comes to protecting our communities from the impacts of climate change. And as you saw in the video, it, it was a, a little more than a year ago that uh, Hurricane Sandy swept a, across the east coast of the United States and the impacts on communities, on families, and damages to homes and businesses uh, was very significant. Uh, in, the, in the aftermath of the disaster, of course, our first priority was uh, to protect people, to rescue people, and first responders uh, at the federal, state, and local level worked around the clock uh, to ensure people's safety. But, but fairly quickly after the storm, leaders in the region and uh, the president and the Obama administration focused on uh, rebuilding and how can we rebuild those places that were affected by Hurricane Sandy to be more resilient. We didn't uh, want to recreate the vulnerabilities that uh, that. Uh, added to the devastation. We wanted to b rebuild communities that would be safe and strong today, but also um, in the future. And this idea that we needed to be prepared, we needed to emphasize resilience, 
um, and that, that needs to be built into everything that we do, is an important um, and key pillar of the Climate Action Plan that President Obama re released in June of this year. In the United States, we know that as the climate changes, um, we expect more uh, extreme weather events like floods and storms, wildfires, heat waves. We expect them to grow more frequent and more severe. And along with the economic costs and the health impacts that are associated with them. So it, for, let's take 2012 alone, the cost of weather disasters in the United States exceeded $110 billion, including uh, Hurricane Sandy. Beyond extreme weather events, we know that carbon pollution also threatens the health of our families, especially our most vulnerable populations. Warmer temperatures spurred by carbon pollution can worsen smog and soot and pollen levels, and that leads to more asthma attacks and other health risks too, like prolonged allergy seasons, increased heat-related illnesses and deaths and changes in the life cycle and distribution of insects that transmit diseases. So in June, as I said, the president released his climate action plan, which, is fo which, which has three focuses, uh, the first on reducing carbon pollution, the second on preparing our country for climate impacts that we can't avoid, and the third is to be, along with our international partners, leaders in combating climate change across the globe. We know we have to work aggressively to curb carbon emissions that are driving climate change so that we can avoid the worst impacts on our families and our businesses. So we're setting new rules to cut carbon pollution from power plants, setting new targets for doubling renewable energy production in our country, and setting new efficiency standards for consumer products like dishwashers and refrigerators that'll save enough electricity to power tens of billions of homes. But even as we take these very important steps to reduce carbon pollution and move our economy towards cleaner and more efficient sources of energy, we also have to improve our ability to manage the effects of climate change that are already being felt. Now this is something that the Obama administration has been working on uh, since the beginning and disasters like Hurricane Sandy only reinforce the importance of making smart investments to improve resilience and to protect our communities. Uh, Hurricane Sandy, I think, proved uh, to us once again that the past is not the best predictor of the future. And just because a place hasn't flooded or the power hasn't failed doesn't mean it never will. So we saw after Hurricane Sandy that the links between our economy, our infrastructure, and our communities can lead to unexpected consequences. For example, in the New York area, there were severe fuel shortages after Hurricane Sandy, not because there wasn't fuel available, but because gas stations that, e that had full supplies of gasoline had no electricity to pump the gas. We also saw good examples of how to build smart smarter to make us less vulnerable. At the campus of New York University in downtown Manhattan, the electric uh, co-generation kept the lights on uh, when the overall grid failed. And you may remember the pictures of downtown Manhattan completely dark after Hurricane Sandy. And in some portions of the U.S. East Coast, a focus on protecting and restoring natural areas like wetlands and dunes provided natural barriers that helped coastal communities behind them fare much better than others. And today we know uh, much more about what to avoid. For example, uh, we saw that hospitals that had put their generators in the basement um, found them useless uh, after the storm because they had flooded um, and left it left critical facilities without backup power when they needed them the most. And again, we saw the pictures of hospitals in uh, downtown Manhattan being evacuated. The investments that we make now need to last for decades, whether it's for rebuilding a bridge in New York or New Jersey or building a new water treatment plant somewhere else. And it's smarter to build them to be able to function in future climate conditions. 
So in the wake of the disaster, the Obama administration created a Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force that was chaired by U.S. Secretary for Housing and Urban Development, Sean Donovan. And the, re the rebuilding strategy that this task force produced made several recommendations for using federal disaster recovery funds to help the region rebuild stronger than before. And we've piloted these approaches in, in the Sandy affected region. And you'll hear a little later from um, Josh Sarslak from HUD, who's here, uh, I think will be here uh, on the web to discuss s uh, in more detail the experiences and the recommendation of the task force. The task force has provided some tangible information and guidance to local decision makers to help with recovery act, uh, efforts. And they've set minimum flood risk reduction standards for all projects that receive federal funds that will incorporate increased risk due to sea level rise and other factors. And, and pro provided interactive sea level rise tool that allows local planners to see how their 100 year floodplain is likely to change. I think we can learn a lot from this regional response to Hurricane Sandy. Both the state of New York and the city of New York have issued reports and plans to build a more, a stronger, more resilient New York, and their work can certainly serve uh, as a model for others around the country, hopefully before disaster strikes. So these lessons are informing the efforts of other regions as well, and and uh, we're pleased to be joined by uh, California Environmental Protection Agency Secretary Matt Rodriguez to talk to us today about how California is using those lessons uh, learned in their own planning. We know that across the nation, uh, building climate preparedness must become an integral part of our, both our disaster preparedness and our disaster recovery work. President Obama's Climate Action Plan calls this out and directs U.S. government agencies to examine their policies and programs and find ways to make it easier for cities and towns to build smarter and stronger. The plan focuses on partnering with U.S. states and cities to prepare for these Im impacts by in investing in stronger and safer infrastructure and protecting critical sectors of our economy and protecting our natural resources. For example, we're directing U.S. government agencies to make sure that any new road, any building or project that's funded with taxpayer dollars is built to withstand the increased flood risks from extreme weather and sea level rise. And we're working to make sure that we have the best data and science on how climate change is going to affect different areas of the country so that we can help local decision makers and businesses by providing them with information and tools that they need to protect their communities and livelihoods. And to ensure that the U.S. federal government's work responds to the needs of communities across the country, earlier this month, President Obama created a task force of governors and mayors and tribal leaders and other elected officials, local elected officials, to advise the U.S. government on additional steps we can take to help communities strengthen their re resilience and climate change, to, to climate change. Uh, Shortly after we announced this task force, we traveled to the state of Delaware. Uh, Delaware Governor Jack Markell is part of our task force. And Delaware's a coastal state that is very, very vulnerable to sea level rise. And they have done some very interesting work um, examining the science uh, of potential impacts on Delaware of sea level rise and techniques and tools that they can use across the state to protect uh, their coastline from sea level rise. And they're just an example of some of the uh, very good work uh, that is happening uh, around climate resilience on the ground in communities across the United States. And we want to make sure that we're using what they've learned and responding to their needs. So uh, these are some of the ways that we're taking the lessons that we learned uh, in response to Hurricane Sandy and other extreme weather events and using them to make the United States safer and stronger. We know that our work isn't done yet, uh, but the uh, Climate Action Plan sets a clear path for us to move forward. And we believe that sharing our knowledge and our experience across the United States and internationally will help us move forward faster. So thank you uh, all again for uh, being here today, and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair Settler.
Okay, now we're going to hear from Josh Sawaslak from HUD. And anyone standing in the back, we've got an empty front row here, so feel free to jump on up and take a seat. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and Nancy, thank you for inviting me. And uh, as you said, it's been about uh, a year since Hurricane Sandy. Uh, this was a huge storm. And as you saw from the video from NOAA and Nancy's remarks, you know, this was a storm that was a thousand miles across. It had uh, tropical storm force winds going out 500 miles from the core. Um, it affected uh, 25 states um, with presidential uh, disaster declarations in 11 states from Virginia to Massachusetts. Before I go on and talk about the recovery and resilient rebuilding, let me say a short thing about emergency response to Sandy. Uh, and that is that it was massive and it began even before the landfall. Uh, the work by FEMA and all of the response agencies along with state, local, private sector responders was really just amazing. Uh, these people are heroes. And, you know, as bad as it was uh, post Sandy, uh, there's no doubt in my mind without this coordinated and massive response effort, uh, the impact would have been many times greater. We need only look at the horrifying reports from the Philippines uh, where thousands of people uh, have perished uh, as a result of Typhoon uh, Haiyan which may be the strongest storm to ever make landfall um, or, or to have been recorded. Uh, wind speed data from uh, high end looked more like it was coming from a tornado than a hurricane. Um, with Sandy, we knew our real challenge uh, would be recovery. And as Nancy mentioned, uh, the president created the Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force. Uh, the task force brought cabinet level leadership uh, to this issue. It was supported by agency staff from across the federal government. Uh, it worked at all levels of government with the private sector and with philanthropic sectors as well. Uh, last August, uh, this August, we issued a strategy report to the president with 69 recommendations. And to be clear, we didn't figure all this out from scratch in six months. We borrowed shamelessly from an incredible wealth of expertise, both from across the nation and across the world. We talked to the Dutch, the British, the Chileans, and lots of experts from Boston to San Diego. The Dutch even loaned us one of their leading experts on water and spatial planning, Hank Obing. And what Hank often reminds me is that they made a lot of mistakes in the Netherlands and we should learn from what they did and what they, uh, the mistakes that they made, but we also need to learn from their successes. Uh, I, had, I was in the Netherlands uh, on vacation last month and uh, it rained a lot the whole time. So I actually got to see how you can fully integrate uh, adaptation into beautiful historic cities without causing visual and aesthetic impacts. And if you've ever been to Amsterdam, um, the first thing that I, I found was everyone talks about the dikes and everything, and you don't realize you're actually standing on top of it. Um, it's built into the street and you don't really know it. Um, I also spent uh, time talking to leaders from Chile where flood risk is not just um, uh, from sea level rise, but from tsunamis as well. Like the Japanese, they face a seismic threat compounded by sea level rise. So our uh, Sandy strategy report is available online, um, but let me uh, highlight a few of the key findings and recommendations. The first and most important is that regardless of the probability of a Sandy type storm happening in the mid-Atlantic uh, again soon, we are at risk from severe weather events. And that risk is increasing due to climate change and development patterns. We ignore this fact at our peril. We must look forward, not backward, to ensure we plan for and adapt to the effects of climate change and development patterns. The second key finding of the Sandy Task Force is that we cannot afford to wait for a disaster to build resilience into our physical and social infrastructure. Recovery is a game of catch up, and you've already lost when you start. We need to build resilience into our homes, our facilities, and our systems before the disaster strikes. If you read the Sandy strategy, and I hope you will, uh, you'll notice a lot of similarities between our findings and recommendations and what's included in the President's Climate Action Plan that Nancy talked about. This is not by accident. These two efforts included the same people and agencies. Nancy was in fact a member of our task force and her staff worked closely with us on our recommendations. Many of these recommendations made sense not just for the Sandy region, but also in cities and towns across the entire country and we incorporated those into the national plan. So let me switch back to Sandy. Of the 69 recommendations in the strategy, more than a third of them focus on resilience and infrastructure. 
They include setting for the first time ever a single federal flood risk standard for rebuilding that recognizes climate change. All federal agencies funding the Sandy Recovery adopted this minimum standard of best available data plus one foot of freeboard to account for near-term sea level rise. And, and please understand, this is a minimum standard. For infrastructure investments funded with Sandy dollars, we've recommended that agencies adopt a set of resilience guidelines to drive rebuilding efforts. These guidelines apply to projects federal agencies are doing themselves or that they are funding through grants and partnerships. There are seven of these guidelines and they're designed to drive federal investment towards resilience. The guidelines include issues such as comprehensive risk analysis, looking forward using science-based data to do that, regional coordination and planning, working together across sectors, across geography, efficacy and fiscal sustainability. We need to be able to uh, build things that work and we need to ensure that we have the funding uh, lined up in order to maintain them and keep them working. Um, and finally, uh, one of the other important things is acknowledging and addressing the inherent uncertainty in predictive analysis. We don't have all the answers. We do know that what the trends are and we know where things are going. We don't exactly know what things will look like in the future, but we have very, very good science and we have very good scientists who are constantly improving this work and we need to listen to them and we need to understand that sometimes what they tell us is you need to prepare for a range of effects. Um, we hope that as we lead by example at the federal level, we will drive efforts uh, beyond just Hurricane Sandy recovery and beyond just federal dollars into the public and private investment in resilience. Uh, to drive resilience, HUD is incorporating these guidelines I mentioned into the requirements for its grantees and our latest release of funding. Um, and the federal uh, register notice for that actually uh, was published yesterday. Um, what this means is that for the first time, states and communities will need to use forward-looking analysis as part of the planning and design of uh, rebuilt and new infrastructure. And that is not to say that no one is doing this. There are several great examples of forward-leaning communities. Um, and some of them have been ahead of us at the federal level. There are great examples, as Nancy said, in Delaware, in California, as we'll hear from in a minute by, uh, from Matt, Southeast Florida and New York City. Uh, let me talk about New York just for a second. Um, prior to Sandy, uh, New York City developed uh, Plan YC, which is a climate change cognizant planning framework. It's built on a platform of science-based forward-looking risk analysis. And they use this effort to form a base on which they built the Mayor's Strategic Initiative for Rebuilding and Resilience, or the SUR effort after Sandy. Uh, I highly recommend that you uh, take a look at the report called A Stronger and More Resilient New York. They looked very closely at coastal and harbor issues and developed approaches that address the risks they face in short and longer time frames. In addition, the Corps of Engineers is preparing a comprehensive study of coastal flood risk reduction approaches that will cover the entire uh, North Atlantic from Norfolk, Virginia to the tip of Maine. Now, due to the geographic reach of this study, it's going to be very broad, but the idea is for the Corps to use this study to explore new approaches to coastal flood risk reduction. Uh, also on the innovation front, um, HUD is taking a new approach to stimulate creativity. In partnership with several philanthropic partners, um, we've launched an international design competition called Rebuild by Design. 10 teams were selected to enter the research phase from 148 submissions uh, by teams across the globe. Uh, these 10 teams have developed multiple project concepts and they were just narrowed to uh, a set that they will take forward into the design phase um, with the goal to work with states and local communities uh, and to fund the best of these projects using Sandy funds uh, from HUD. In the area of green infrastructure, um, which provides both adaptation uh, and carbon reduction, we're working on tools to better calculate the true cost effectiveness and return on investment from alternatives to steel and concrete. Uh, much of this resilience effort is funded by um, uh, FEMA and DOT uh, for the Sandy recovery, and their projects must be shown to be cost effective to be approved. Without better metrics, green projects are often dismissed because they don't meet the criteria. 
Um, the problem's not the projects, but rather the criteria, and we're aiming to fix that. But as I said at the beginning, starting with recovery is a loser's game. We need to get ahead of the curve and build forward-looking resilience into everything we do. It must be the norm, not just the response to disasters. We know that every dollar we spend on resilience saves us $4 in recovery, so it's just good economics to do it on the front end. So another of our recommendations was to look at the applicability of these infrastructure resilience guidelines nationally and for all investments in infrastructure, not just post-disaster. Uh, and that's going to be done in concert with the efforts Nancy discussed uh, to implement the President's Climate Action Plan. So if I leave you with just one thought, I hope it's that we must change the way we think about resilience and plan and build for the future, not the past. We must make resilience a given in all of our efforts, not something you think about later, because later already happened. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, are you able to stay with us for the Q&A period uh, at the end, or uh, should we ask uh, you a couple questions now? Uh, it would be better for me if I could do them now, but I'll stay if that uh, okay. if you need me. I know it's early for you in the morning, and you probably actually have to get to, to your, your day, day job. So uh, I, I do have a meeting with the secretary, so I good. should probably. Uh, good. Well, let's take one or two questions, if we have any specific questions for Josh, before we move to uh, Secretary Rodriguez. Okay, I've got three, so I'll just take them all at the same time, and, and Josh, you can uh, answer them at your leisure. Great. Um, Dave Millard, representing the American Chemical Society. Um, how do you gauge, like, I know after the storm in New York, they made a, they made declarations saying that they're going to build flood, uh, fl uh, flood barriers, and they're saying that they're going to be, you know, four feet over what Sandy was. How do they gauge or, you know, Obviously, if we go business as usual, storms are going to get worse, so four feet's going to be useless in a couple of years. So based off like the predictions with, with sea level rise, how do they gauge how they should build those? Okay, let's take another one. I'm Cynthia Rosenzweig. I'm the co-chair of the New York City panel on climate change, and we made this the sea level rise projection. Um, that are being used in the rebuilding. Um, but I wanted, I did want to ask Josh, um, what were the lessons learned about coordinating across the jurisdictions? Part of, it was very, because of being part of it, how do you, you know, how do you work with New York City, New York State, New Jersey, all taking a different, um, different tack at, at, on, on, on rebuilding and resiliency, and how can we help to coordinate the efforts even better? Thanks. Okay, and just one more here. Adam Solkowski, University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. I hope my students are not seeing this awkward moment. <laughs> okay, whatever. I'm just going to be attached to my computer. Um, thank you. Great talk. Uh, my big question, this is spontaneous, wasn't planned. Besides the coordination with local governments, which is a fascinating uh, issue, how you coordinate all the way from state down to local level where you have the building codes, Miami, there are some places in the world that are going to be sacrificed, or at least that's the way it looks like to some of us that travel through and don't see any way that you can build a protective dike. Um, what are the plans for a place like that? Miami South Beach, are we going to be able to visit in 20 years? Is it protectable? I guess that's the question. Are there some places that are just not defensible? Very challenging questions for you, so we're not getting you off easy here at 7 in the morning. Okay, well, the good news is they're, they're easier to start, um, so I'll do, the, I'll do the easy one first. Um, as far as how you pick a level, it's really a risk-based analysis. And I think in the NOAA video, they talked a little bit about the um, uh, sea level rise tool that takes best available data, um, and whether that's the FEMA, existing FEMA mapping um, or new data that either FEMA or someone else has developed. Um, and adds onto that projections for sea level rise. Um, so that gets you um, to a certain point, and that helps you understand what the uh, current and future flood zones are going to look like. But when you're looking at something like storm surge, you really have to do modeling of storm and wind. And um, if you find Cynthia afterwards, um, uh, she can probably explain to you some of the stuff that New York has been doing, really looking at what the um, the storm surge impacts would be from uh, various storm scenarios. 
they really looked very closely from a risk-based analysis using science to say, what should we be looking at in this specific location? Um, <clears throat> you have to know what the uh, design uh, uh, life of the asset is. You have, to, you have to make some decisions about what the cost um, to you of the loss of that asset is. If it's, um, you know, if it's a residence and you can evacuate it, um, and the real issue is that you're gonna have to rebuild it, um, that's one issue. If it's a hospital um, or a fire station, um, or a community sheltering facility. If it's something that the loss of the facility is uh, much greater and that you actually need it during and after the disaster, then <clears throat> from a risk perspective, you may be willing to put more money in to make that uh, resilient, to build the wall higher, to elevate um, whatever the issue is. If you look at some of the work that they've done around the world, especially um, some of the stuff we saw in Chile, where they built facilities basically with a first floor that was uh, a, they had the ability to sacrifice. The walls would wash away. Um, they wouldn't store anything down there um, that was not replaceable. And um, because they're looking at a, a, you know, a tsunami risk where they may have a little bit of warning, but they're certainly not going to have three days. Um, so I think that the, the trick to this is, is really being able to have that scientific-based risk analysis. A lot of the data are out there, especially in, in the New York and New Jersey area. Um, but we're certainly looking at uh, how to create um, tools for the rest of the country. Uh, Florida actually has a tool that was done um, based on the work that, that Noah and others did <clears throat> um, and actually done by a, uh, an NGO who took that data and created uh, a similar product for Florida. Um, Cynthia, as far as the regional coordination, um, and let me say, uh, Cynthia is one of the, the uh, primary folks behind the work in New York um, and was on the mayor's panel, um, and she was actually just presenting uh, along with uh, along uh, that I was in uh, Boston at a conference, uh, and so I got to see her presentation, which was uh, excellent. Um, on the regional coordination issue, I think this is really key, and it's a, one of our bigger recommendations, is that we need to look across sectors and across geography. Because, for example, in the Sandy region, we're putting something like 20 or $30 billion into infrastructure. Um, many of these systems are, are linked. They are uh, interdependent. Uh, for example, as uh, Nancy mentioned, you've got uh, fuel issues, liquid fuel issues, gas stations, uh, terminals, that they lost power. And the problem wasn't that the facility was damaged. The problem was they had electricity. So, for uh, some of these stations, uh, New Jersey and New York State have, are mandating that um, uh, stations are pre-wired for generators so that they can literally bring generators in and get them back online. Uh, in New York City, the issue actually wasn't the electricity at the station. Um, most of the gas stations in, in Manhattan are not actually in Lower Manhattan. Um, the problem was getting fuel to Lower Manhattan. There were damages at the terminals, um, <clears throat> one in, in Linden, New Jersey, uh, basically cut off the fuel supply to Manhattan. So. Um, the, the key here is really bringing everybody together, and, and HUD is leading an effort right now to work across all levels of government um, to try to get people to work together. Um, <clears throat> one good example of this is some work that's going on right now uh, in Manhattan uh, related to three hospitals <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that are uh, next to each other in uh, what's called Hospital Row. And we have three different funding sources, three different owners. Um, they're literally co-located uh, within a block of each other, and they're addressing similar issues. And so the idea is, and not necessarily is this going to be one big project. Um, we're going to let the, the design and the, and the data drive this, but we want to ensure that uh, everybody knows what everybody else is doing and that they make decisions in light of that. Um, let, me, let me try to address the, the Miami question. Um, what I can tell you about Southeast Florida is that um, they have a very forward-leaning uh, approach to um, addressing these issues. Um, and there is a Southeast Florida um, climate change compact for counties in Southeast Florida who have gotten together and said, we need, you know, we, we all share this issue and we live in a place that is very vulnerable. And so we need to address these issues. Um, and we can certainly connect you with the folks um, who are, are running that uh, uh, that compact. I don't know what the specific issue is for Miami Beach. I, I do know that they're 
um, are many places um, that depending on what the um, near and long-term sea level rise uh, uh, um, final uh, numbers are, we are going to have a hard time. And it's not just storm surge. Um, it's high tide and back bay flooding in a lot of these places, barrier islands. Um, and it's not just Miami. Uh, when you look at the projections, um, it's pretty scary. So I think, you know, it is time um, that we address these issues and make those decisions. Uh, and that's what, uh, as Nancy said, the, the president's executive order is about looking at how we do that and, and helping um, local communities make those decisions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. And thanks for joining us. Okay, I'd like to turn it over to Secretary Rodriguez, and he's going to put some of this into perspective on uh, how we are coordinating across uh, states in the U.S. And, and sharing lessons. Okay, if you don't mind, I think I'll just uh, sit here. Please. Um, you know, I uh, arrived in Warsaw on uh, Sunday. Uh, yesterday was a high adrenaline day, and it was exciting to be here. Uh, this afternoon, some of the thrill is wearing off, and so I'm going to uh, sit here and uh, conserve my energy and try and move ahead uh, briefly here. Um, oh, let me first say that, of course, uh, what we're very interested in doing in California is preventing uh, climate change, uh, and so that we don't have to adapt uh, to the problems that will result from uh, climate change. Uh, as many of you have probably heard, we have a number of programs in California that are designed to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, that are designed to prevent climate change from occurring. Uh, for example, we're investing in renewable energy. Uh, we've started a, a cap and trade program that we hope will lead to reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from the uh, industrial and energy, energy uh, producing uh, sectors. Um, we, we've got a number of programs that are designed to change the fuels that we're using in our cars and to make our cars more efficient and to move to uh, uh, electric cars. So we're moving ahead on a whole number of uh, uh, programs, uh, but we're only 2% of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And, and even though we're here talking to everybody at this conference about how we need to work together to deal with climate change, uh, we realize that uh, we need to prepare a defense in depth, if you will, and that adaptation is a very, very important uh, area for us to look at as well, particularly because California is looking at a range of problems. Uh, 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 we'll put earthquakes aside for a second, and we'll deal with some of the uh, potential problems that can arise in California as a result of uh, climate change. That includes flooding uh, from changes in precipitation. Uh, it includes uh, sea level rise, uh, which is an issue for our coastline. Um, we're seeing uh, that there's the potential for extreme heat events. Uh, you know, uh, as you well know, California has a very varied climate throughout the state. There are deserts and, and portions of the state. We have the Central Valley, which is subject to uh, extreme uh, heat events. Um, and then additionally, uh, with changes in precipitation patterns comes the uh, threat of fire. Uh, California just recently experienced, uh, I think, the, the third largest fire um, in California's history. Um, and the risk of fire is going to become much greater uh, if uh, there is climate change. Um, and then there's just the uh, effect of, of, of dealing with changes in precipitation patterns. Water has always been an issue for California, and we have to adjust to the fact that uh, water may not be as available uh, in the future if climate changes. Um, so uh, we're aware of these problems. Fortunately, I think uh, we've done a good outreach uh, to the, the, the um, public in California. Um, and certainly uh, uh, situations like uh, uh, Superstorm Sandy underscore the fact that you have to be prepared and you have to be prepared to be resilient and deal with uh, extreme events as they occur. And so what we see in California is that 63% uh, uh, of the population already uh, feels that you're seeing climate change and that we have to do something about adaptation. 77% um, of the uh, population think that uh, global warming is, is already a problem. Uh, and 82% of the public says we should be doing something about uh, uh, getting ready for climate change uh, right now. So you see that there's public interest in doing something about climate change. And additionally, uh, one of the offices within Cal EPA, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessments, 
did a report last summer that indicated that climate change uh, is already, and, and, and the effects of climate change are already occurring in California. Uh, so we're already experiencing sea level rise. Uh, it's about seven inches in certain portions of the uh, coast. Uh, we're seeing changes in precipitation uh, patterns in California. Uh, the prediction is that the snowpack that we rely on to provide water for California is going to start moving south along the Sierras over time, and so that will change how we deal with our uh, water resources in California. So we're already seeing a number of changes uh, that we need to prepare for. So what are we doing about this? Uh, well, California started preparing uh, several years ago to deal with climate change and adaptation issues. Uh, uh, the first adaptation strategy came out in 2009, and we're currently updating that uh, report. Uh, it's called Safeguarding California, and it's going to set out a, a list of policies and programs that we can follow in California as we're making decisions as government agencies on how to deal for uh, climate change and, and how to prepare for adaptation. Um, we've uh, got several... Um, uh, organizations within the state that are prepared to coordinate activities at the state and local level. So, for example, as the uh, Secretary for Environmental Protection in California, I'm the head of the Climate Action Team. Uh, the Climate Action Team consists of representatives of all the boards and departments and agencies in California that have some piece of the climate change puzzle. Um, to see that we're coordinating our programs, to make sure that we're not duplicating uh, our efforts, and to make sure that we're focusing on the right issues. And we're bringing adaptation issues through that climate action team. Additionally, we're trying to get information out on how we should deal with uh, adaptation issues to agencies, to local governments, uh, so for example, and, and to the public as well. So for example, uh, you can find on the CalADAPT website identification of those areas in California that are subject to flooding or subject to fire so that you can look up your piece of uh, property and uh, determine uh, what your risk is and what sort of problems you may have to uh, prepare for in the future. Um, additionally, uh, just this last summer, um, uh, Cal EPA uh, worked with the Department of Public Health to put an urban heat island and uh, health guidance document uh, out. Uh, that document does a couple of things. It identifies things that we can do when we're building our communities uh, to make them more resilient to extreme heat situations. So for example, uh, the suggestion is that we should be having cool roofs, uh, cool pavement. Uh, we need to be uh, um, uh, focusing on um, urban forests that can help to cool our communities so that we're uh, more resilient and we can adapt to uh, extreme heat events. Additionally, we need to uh, make sure that we've got a uh, health programs and a health infrastructure that can deal with heat uh, uh, events. And so that uh, it particularly, for example, in poorer communities where they don't have as much uh, um, air conditioning, that we've got cool places for people to go when there are extreme uh, uh, heat events. Um, uh, we're looking at uh, building resilience into our infrastructure and our transportation infrastructure. Uh, our California Transportation Agency uh, has sent out guidance to the metropolitan uh, planning organizations in the state. These are regional organizations, giving them guidance on how they have to build uh, adaptivity uh, into their um, adaptivity. I have to think about whether that's really a word. Uh, adaptability into uh, uh, adaptability. I like that better. Uh, into uh, their regional uh, 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 transportation planning. So let's not build our roadways in uh, floodplains if we can avoid it. Uh, let's build the roadways in a way that if there is flooding or if there is a, uh, a, a surge in tides, that, that our transportation uh, corridors are still uh, functioning. Um, additionally, um, uh, state agencies that deal with the uh, coast have looked at um, uh, dealing with sea level rise and are trying to protect sea level lie, uh, rise and are trying to come up with policies that will guide development on our coasts. 
This is very important for uh, a place like California, where, for example, both the main airports in the San Francisco Bay Area sit right at the edge of the bay. Uh, so we've got to plan ahead and we've got to figure out how are we going to maintain uh, um, transportation by air into these areas uh, when there are extreme uh, events and if there, are, uh, if there is flooding. Um, so we're trying to plan ahead. Um, and another example of that is the water action plan that we are working out in the state of California. What we're trying to do is we feel the sense of urgency. As I said earlier, water has always been an issue for California. Uh, there are a lot of people. Um, and uh, we know that by 2050, there will probably be 50 million Californians. Um, and so we're trying to make sure that we are utilizing our water resources in the state in the most efficient and effective manner that we can. That requires that we look at recycling. Uh, that requires that we really consider how we transport water around the state. It, it requires that we try and uh, provide resilience in the state uh, and so that we can deal with extreme events having to do with water. Um, we've been working out uh, uh, on these issues with other states as well. Uh, the Pacific Coast Collaborative is, a, is an organization, an informal organization that we have with Oregon and Washington and British Columbia. And we've talked about how we can better deal with extreme events through joint planning on infrastructure improvements, how we can look at sea level rise. Um, and we're working together with other states um, to, uh, to deal with extreme uh, heat events. Um, and then we're trying to look ahead to 2050. That's sort of our, our target date for looking ahead. Um, and the governor has just uh, put out a, um, an environmental goal and policy report. Uh, a draft of that report is available. Um, I will say it's the second environmental goal and uh, policy report that's been done. The first report was done by Governor Brown and uh, 1978 or 1979, and now that he's governor again, we're going to do another one of these uh, uh, reports that will try to prepare us for 50 million Californians in the year 2050. Um, and that will set out policies that, again, reflect what we're trying to do to make the state resilient, to make sure that we're utilizing our resources appropriately, and that we're prepared for some of the extreme events that may occur as a result of uh, uh, climate change. Um, so uh, with that, I'll just say, you know, it, it's a daunting task, uh, but we're aware that it's one we have to take on. Um, and we also know that we're not alone in taking on this task, uh, and that's why the uh, governor was pleased to be named to the president's uh, climate task force, because we look forward to working collaboratively with the federal government uh, to deal with these very, very serious issues that we see on the uh, horizon. Uh, working collaboratively, we're sure we can come up with the, the right policies and plans, um, but it, it, it will take all of us working together. Thank you, Secretary Rodriguez. Okay, now I'll turn it to uh, Julie, and we have uh, some slides for her as well. Great. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to head over here, but first, I want to get to know you a bit on the way. I'm wondering if there's anyone in this room who supports disaster management efforts, whether, like Cynthia, contributing to the science that disaster managers use, working on policy efforts, or actually working in disaster preparedness and response directly. If you are related to disaster management in any of those ways, could you stand up so we can see how many people here have disaster management on their minds in their day-to-day? Okay, great. It's good to see some experience there. And then I have, you can go ahead and sit down. Another question. If you were directly affected by Hurricane Sandy, I want to also see that either anywhere on the spectrum from coordinating the government response effort all the way to the other end of the spectrum, staying overnight in a shelter for weeks uh, while you looked for another place to move to. If you were at any way connected to Hurricane Sandy, can you also stand up? Great. Thank you. So uh, I'm looking forward to especially hearing your experiences during the question and answer time. And now I want to share with you some of the experiences from the American Red Cross, as well as how they link to our international efforts. All right, great. So I have a couple of goals today, uh, like I said, to talk about the lessons that we've learned and also talk about some of the work we're doing internationally. 
You may have wondered during the introduction why someone from Uganda is standing here, but I do work for the American Red Cross, and one of our focuses in the partnership with the Uganda Red Cross Society is urban resilience measures in different uh, metropolitan centers around the country. So the hurricane experience, Hurricane Sandy experience from the American Red Cross is also helping us in some of that planning in Uganda as well, even though it doesn't have hurricanes. Um, still, the idea of large disaster response in metropolitan areas, there are many lessons learned. To first give you a snapshot of uh, some of what we did during that relief, I have the next slide. I don't have a, okay, there we go. I'm gonna leave this one up for a bit uh, while I talk, but basically, we um, delivered 17 million meals and snacks uh, to people during the Hurricane Sandy response. We had 17,000 disaster workers involved in responding to Hurricane Sandy. This is the majority of whom were volunteers that were trained by the Red Cross before Hurricane Sandy or during. Thank you. This was the largest response operation that the American Red Cross had in five years uh, since Hurricane Katrina. But it posed uh, additional unique challenges, not only due to the scale, but also due to the complexity and diversity of the New York area. And most of the lessons learned I'm going to focus on are the New York City lessons in particular, because that was the most complex and diverse um, in a new way to the American Red Cross. The first, of course, is the vertical response. If you think of New York City, and if you've never been there, that's also okay, but the New York City skyline is iconic and the buildings are huge, so how do you reach people that need relief when they're on the 20th floor, the 30th floor of a building and there's no power to use the elevator? Uh, so that was a really big challenge for the American Red Cross, one of which we're still trying to figure out today. And also, how do you tailor the relief supplies that you're giving? A lot of flood relief supplies include cleaning supplies, which is not relevant if you're on the 15th floor of a building because you didn't actually get water in your house. And that takes us to the other lesson, is how to tailor the relief supplies, and also how to look at um, traffic issues and fuel accessibility. Fuel uh, seems to be a common theme among the speakers, but if you don't have enough supplies already prepositioned in the city and you need to bring them in, you also have to fight with New York City traffic. It's not going away. And you also have to find fuel uh, to move your trucks and move those supplies around. So in response to that, we've started pre-positioning more supplies in the New York area to try and decrease the delays that came during Hurricane Sandy because of those issues. Also looking at the cultural diversity of the city. New York City is one of the most diverse places on the planet. Um, and how to, one of the things for the American Red Cross was to look at when we're distributing these meals, how do we tailor them to neighborhoods so that they're culturally appropriate to the majority of people in those neighborhoods? Many of the neighborhoods in New York City are very unique and they have their own cultures. So how do you tailor meals to dietary restrictions and to the cultural preferences of people living in different neighborhoods? And for that, we uh, worked well with a lot of catering services to try and help bolster that. And then we also uh, had to draw on resources from our Red Cross societies abroad. So bringing in uh, colleagues from the Mexican Red Cross as well as the Canadian Red Cross to help with translation services. Because again, New York City is a very diverse place and there's a lot of translation needs there as well. And we needed that support from our colleagues abroad. Um, in order to give this support, because it was such a massive scale, I have the next slide, which is just meant to show scale, not actually to be able to be read. If I can have the next slide. Yeah, we funded over 50 local partners uh, in a variety of areas. And so these are all of the people, which you can also find on our website, all of the organizations that have been funded to help provide additional uh, relief and recovery support during the Hurricane Sandy relief. And uh, another huge thing for us, which was a, a very significant asset, was social media. So during the hurricane uh, preparedness and response, we had 2,000 uh, social, uh, social media response team volunteers around the country responding to questions on Twitter, on Facebook, et cetera, about how to prepare for the hurricane, what to do after the power goes out, trying to address the needs of people that um, were trying to figure out how to handle this hurricane, which hadn't happened in a city before. Um, and people used their mobile phones and reached out in these ways that they were used to, and these, luckily the phones for at least a certain amount of time continued even after the power goes off, so it's a good way to reach to people while the power is still there. Then another question for you guys. Um, how many of you, just you could raise your hand this time, how many of you have a smartphone in your pocket right now? Great, can I have the next slide please? Another really big thing for us during Hurricane Sandy was mobile apps. So we have a hurricane app. 
which is the one on the left, that hurricane app during Hurricane Sandy was viewed 32 million times with an average view time of about nine minutes. Typically for one of our preparedness apps, because we have many, normal view time during a, a non-disaster situation is only two or three minutes. So it was really uh, used heavily during Hurricane Sandy. As a result of um, the Hurricane Sandy uh, volunteer efforts as well, we've also developed a volunteer app to better engage with volunteers that are very uh, event specific and are not necessarily with the Red Cross in the day to day, but when a disaster comes, they want to still be involved and support their communities. Now, going global for a second, for the few remaining minutes, uh, the American Red Cross, through its Global Disaster Preparedness Center, which is a, a center hosted by the American Red Cross to support Red Cross, Red Crescent societies around the world, has also been developing a first aid app, which you can see on the right. And this one is also available in the US market. So uh, about two million people in uh, the United States have this app. And we're beginning to support national societies to roll it out globally. The countries on the bottom are where it's already gone live in the past few months. There are 10 more countries on the way this year, and we hope to have another 100 countries uh, over the course of 2014. This will be able to provide first aid uh, information during emergencies, as well as to help people train themselves on first aid around the world, culturally specific to countries and also language specific. So uh, a few more comments on international. Over half of the world's population is currently living in cities, and it's a trend that continues to increase. More and more people are moving into cities. So as the Red Cross, we need to really better understand how to respond to disasters in cities and how to uh, deal with these issues like physical and ecosystems. How can we help liaise with uh, government entities around the world to ensure that if a, 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 transfer, a physical system breaks down, it doesn't have a multiplying effect? So for example, if the power goes off, can you still get fuel? Right? The system should be able to fail safe. So how can we help to ensure that these systems are failing safe so that if one goes down, it doesn't impact other systems and it doesn't also cause um, a larger effect than it needs to cause, basically. Also how to capture cultural and legal norms such as the cultural diversities of major cities and how to work with partners and people and organizations to make sure that we're responding better. The time to talk about partnerships is before a disaster, not during a disaster. So we try to help support our national society colleagues around the world as well in uh, identifying those partners in an urban area. Finally, um, looking at transferring cash, this is something that is actually new to the global movement of disaster response, but not to the Red Cross. So the Red Cross will give uh, during its domestic disaster relief operations, debit cards, for example, so families can go and buy their own items. In the case of Hurricane Sandy, they were given debit cards to meet their health needs, like prescription drugs, et cetera. However, globally, uh, transferring cash through a variety of means is not used widely yet, but it's an important issue because it allows people to prioritize their own needs. So we're also supporting a lot of national societies around the world um, in setting up these systems to be able to give people their own, um, their own priorities instead of distributing relief items which may or may not always be best suited for the situation. The last thing I want to say um, is basically just a short comment about um, Haiyan as well. Uh, just to give an update that the Red Cross, the American Red Cross for the Americans in the room, have uh, has committed already $11 million. But what I really want to say is that our family tracing services are also open. And that's the case for any national society around the world. So if anyone has family in the Philippines and they're still not able to find them, you can reach out to your local Red Cross chapter to ask them to help you find your family. And you can also do that to your National Red Cross Society. And then, of course, if you want to donate, feel free to go to our website. <laughs> but the most important thing, of course, is finding your family if they happen to still be missing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, some time for questions now, so I'd like to take maybe uh, two at a time and then give our panelists a, a chance to answer. Do we have any questions in the audience? Okay. So we'll take one more if anyone's got one floating around in your head. If nobody else uh, has one, uh, could you explain how the Red Cross coordinates with the government? It seems like the government in a lot of the disasters almost relies that you guys will be there. So could you explain you're an NGO, but you work so closely with the government. So how does that work? And does it work the same way in every country? That's a great, that's a great question. Uh, thank you for that one. 
Um, basically, the Red Cross isn't exactly an NGO either. <laughs> it's not government. It's not an NGO. We're uh, uh, considered auxiliary to government. So, I mean, we're not the government. In that sense, we are an NGO. But um, the Red Cross, in order for the Red Cross to exist in any country, it has to be established by an act of Congress or an act of Parliament. And in that act, it will name the Red Cross as uh, auxiliary to government in times of disaster. So that's why, and that's throughout the world, it's the only way you can form a Red Cross society, and there only can only be one cr Red Cross society in every country. So that's why you see us always involved in disasters. Okay, one more question uh, here. Oh, do you have a response, Nancy? Wanted to add on the, on the Red Cross that um, there is a really close working relationship um, the person in the White House who was in charge of disaster preparedness is now uh, with the Red Cross and has gone back and forth a couple of times. So I think there's a good, at least in the U.S., a good interchange between uh, the uh, U.S. federal government and the Red Cross in developing how we respond to disasters. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question right here. Thank you very much. I'm uh, from Uganda, working with the Uganda National Roads Authority. <laughs> and a student uh, of environmental policy at the American Public University. I'm interested in uh, uh, the urban uh, resilience programs. Uh, how did you come up with these uh, programs and uh, where are they? Thank you. Okay, and let me just take uh, one more question and answer them together. Okay, um, my name is Camille Chow from Taiwan and uh, I would like to have one question and also one experience sharing. The question is, uh, after the uh, Hurricane Sandy, do you have any special funding uh, for the uh, resilience or reconstruction? Uh, um, then um, my experience sharing in Taiwan is, uh, a few years ago in uh, 2009, we had a very serious uh, disaster called uh, Typhoon Morocco. And that disaster, uh, uh, more than 700 people died in one m one night, even the one village um, in one second. So after that, we passed a very special law uh, for the special funding uh, for the reconstruction. And also we built up a special uh, council in the cabinet. So uh, the council can coordinate with the local government, central governments, and also the NGOs. So uh, actually we had very, uh, uh, special partnership with NGOs like Red Cross in Taiwan and uh, World Vision and Trinity Foundation. So um, we passed the uh, reconstruction works uh, through the NGOs. They built up the uh, sustain uh, sustainable uh, village for the, uh, the, the uh, people who, after the disaster, they can live there for a long time. And also after that, uh, we have some uh, training for the uh, uh, resilience people and, and um, to the captains who uh, can live there for the long, uh, longer period. Yeah, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, thanks. And, and let's, after uh, we answer these questions, let's continue to share our experiences because that, that's what this event's about. So please. Question on uh, urban resilience plans and um, also uh, the question from this gentleman, the second one. Okay, great, I'll take the uh, Red Cross question in Uganda. Um, so basically, how did we decide to work on urban resilience? This is a, it's a growing trend globally. Traditionally, uh, disaster risk reduction has been focused in rural areas, uh, especially, um, especially in developing countries. And but as more and more people are moving into urban areas, there is a growing trend to focus on urban resilience, especially in medium-sized cities, let's say, where people are moving in, but the municipals don't ha necessarily have resources available to them to meet that growing influx of people. Uh, to come to your question specifically about Uganda, I will follow up with you more uh, afterwards, but to briefly answer it, it's in two cities in the north, Gulu and Lira. Uh, focusing on fire risks, flood risks, and traffic risks. And then we are also working on an assessment for uh, some risk reduction in Kampala. But let's talk about that more afterwards. For the, uh, the resilience funding question, uh, so after, shortly after Hurricane Sandy, 
uh, the United States Congress uh, passed what's called a supplemental appropriations bill um, in part to fund uh, the disaster recovery, but also um, significantly in each of the uh, sort of major work areas, uh, the Congress allocated money towards uh, building more resiliently. And so um, you heard from Josh uh, from HUD about one program, the Community Development Block Grant Program uh, that HUD manages, uh, which um, this the last round of money that went out um, also uh, looked at re uh, resilience and resilience planning. Um, there were some other things that were in the bill that are interesting uh, from resilience perspective. Uh, there was money allocated towards the Army Corps of Engineers to look along the entire um, East Coast, essentially, uh, and uh, and to actually uh, look at um, kind of comprehensively at uh, coastal protection uh, in light of uh, in light of the need to build uh, to build resilience and and. Um, just if I could comment on the urban area issue, I think p part of the um, lessons learned from Hurricane Sandy uh, really gets to this idea that you've got to um, be able to respond in the short term, but also to uh, build resiliently uh, for the future. And I think as you heard, the traditional way that in the United States we've responded to disasters is to um, put everything back the way it was, and um, particularly in urban areas where you have to respond quickly, per, given the uh, populations there are at risk, um, making sure that uh, you can respond quickly, but also um, look at ways to uh, to build resilience in, so that we're not just putting things back the way they are. And in, as as you heard, we were fortunate in the Sandy area that there was um, really strong. Uh, coordination, cooperation, um, and um, interest from the local governments in the area to do just that. Okay, we have one question back here and I'll take one up here, back there first. Hi, I'm Rachel Jacobson, a student at the University of Michigan. Um, and I'm wondering about, <laughs> yes, I was, Chair Sally, I was an intern for you this summer. Um, I'm wondering about um, how you go about identifying gaps and overlaps in adaptation actions, especially there's been a big upswing in interest in working on adaptation, but those um, actions are coming from you know, both NGOs and then all sectors of government. So what processes have you put in place or uh, mechanisms are you using to identify the overlaps and the gaps in adaptation action? Okay, overlaps and the gaps, and then let's take one question here. Hi, I'm Jesse Gerson with the uh, Clinton Foundation's uh, Climate Initiative. Um, <coughs> we heard a little bit about uh, the California public's perceptions on climate change and how those are, are, um, are changing. I'm curious a little bit about uh, policymakers' perceptions on climate change and um, whether or not you think uh, Hurricane Sandy and other natural disasters are perversely um, a, maybe a good thing for the climate change discourse in the US. Um, I don't mean that as a provocative question, but just to hear your opinions. Uh, with regard to how do we identify uh, gaps and overlaps um, in adaptation planning, uh, I alluded to the fact that you know we've created a um, an informal uh, group working group within uh, California uh, that really is comprised of all the state agencies that have to do s with with climate and adaptation. Um, and then what you do is you take the report uh, that is produced out of that process and you make it a very public process. And, and so uh, we just received comments from a gentleman sitting uh, not too far from you uh, representing a number of organizations uh, on the adaptation plan that we're working on right now. It has to be a very public process so that we can hear a variety of perspectives um, and so that we can test out the policies that we're developing to make sure that there are no overlaps. Um, additionally, we are uh, right now 
uh, sort of restructuring some of our emergency response agencies. Again, it's a matter of getting the agencies together at the federal, the state, and the local level to get them together, compare their programs, compare notes, and say, what are you working on? And then uh, reach out to the stakeholders and the public uh, and, and have them sort of do a, a, uh, a reality check on what it is that we're trying to do because it's important that you make sure you're being pragmatic and that you're really understanding the practical impacts of what it is you're trying to do. So it requires a little bit of outreach. It requires that um, so sometimes that you draw together agencies that wouldn't normally be working together or you don't think in terms of having them work together. But that's what we've been trying to do, to make sure we've got all the right people in the room and that we reach out to the public. Um, with regard to uh, storms, you know, I, I, uh, one of the things we were very, very careful about, to be quite uh, honest, after uh, Superstorm Sandy was not to say, oh, see, this validates uh, our concerns about climate change because you don't want to be perceived as taking advantage of a terrible tragedy that affects other people. Um, but it does highlight the fact that we do need to be prepared for these events. Um, and when you're sitting down one-on-one -on -one, uh, with people, we can say, look, we, we don't want to foresee um, unimaginable tragedies, but uh, you know, recent history shows that they do occur, and we need to be prepared. Um, and we can't, you don't want to be in a situation where you're just learning what your process is while the emergency is unfolding. Um, and so it adds a certain immediacy and urgency, and you can take advantage of that. And so I, I, I think we've seen that in government officials, um, and it does support our actions in trying to come up with uh, uh, adaptation plans and get everybody working together. I don't know whether anybody has anything that. Just um, on, the, on the first question about um, overlaps and gaps, I think one thing um, we sort of start with is, is the science and um, the uh, U.S. Uh, global change research program is um, at the tail end of its um, uh, quadrennial um, uh, national climate assessment, and this uh, version is is focused on 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 adaptation, on preparedness and resilience, and in providing uh, information, um, even really tailored at the at the regional uh, level in the U.S. to try to. Uh, help um, decision makers uh, who have to deal with these issues. Um, so uh, the science is very important. Uh, these kinds of assessments are very important. Um, and um, I think as well, we uh, started early on um, in 2009 looking at what federal agencies uh, in the United States needed to do to uh, be prepared to deal with the impacts of climate change. and. Uh, and I think out of that work really grew this idea that um, we need to look across uh, across agencies uh, to the federal government overall, how we work with state and local government, but also looking at critical uh, sectors of the economy. So uh, work that's been done, for example, by the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, looking at the vulnerability of the U.S. energy sector to uh, impacts of climate change. So. Um, I, uh, at the moment, I'm not too worried about uh, overlaps. I think I'm more worried about gaps. Um, and uh, we, you know, we continue to, to move forward uh, trying to work together. So uh, part of uh, the Climate Action Plan in the United States, we uh, created a, a Climate Resilience Council um, that I co-chair of, uh, made up of any federal agencies to ensure that we're coordinating uh, on the work and uh, and filling in gaps um, as we need to. Um, on the on the question about um, perception, I think uh, there's no doubt that um, you know immediately after uh, Hurricane Sandy, there was a lot of sort of attention in the press as you know, is this a sign of a changing climate? Um, uh, uh, you know, Mayor Bloomberg uh, famously made <laughs> uh, some interesting statements, um, and um, but I but I think um, you know as we talk to uh, officials around the country, as we think um, at the federal level about the things that we need to do, is that it, that climate change isn't necessarily introducing new risks; it's magnifying risks that are, uh, that are already there, that it's magnifying vulnerabilities that are already there, and that. Um, we, you know, we have um, in the U.S. Um, you know, very um, robust 
um, disaster response um, uh, frameworks and institutions. Um, and I think it, as we, you know, as we think about w what else we need to do, it's really, um, I think, based on uh, the belief that uh, we can't assume that the the future will look like today, and how do we address um, those risks? So, uh, you know, we have gotten a very good response um, to our, for example, to our call um, for. Uh, elected officials at the state and local level to participate in the task force that we established a couple of weeks ago. We put out a call for nominations, got 120 uh, nominations. So there's a lot of interest uh, in the opportunities <laughs> to work together uh, across uh, levels of government in the United States uh, to deal with these issues. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much for sharing those experiences, and thank you for your good questions and your experiences. We're going to end this event with another quick testimonial from uh, Noah, but I want to point out to you that in about 10 minutes, we'll have uh, a NASA Hyperwall presentation. I invite you all to that, and at 4 p.m. today, we'll have an event on the rewards and challenges of women working in climate change. So uh, that's a professional development climate careers uh, focused event uh, for women. So thank you again, everyone, and let's uh, take a look at one more testimonial on your way out. All stations, all stations, all stations. This is the United States Coast Guard. A powerful storm will begin impacting offshore Monday, the 29th of October. The destruction that happened from Sandy was very intense. I think it caught a lot of people off guard. It was overwhelming. It was frightening. The boardwalk was like a roller coaster. It was up and down and big pieces missing. Houses were floating down the street. It looked like a bomb went off. It, it looked like a war. It was just massive destruction. Sandy has been likened a lot to the hurricane of 1962, but we've had a lot more development on the Jersey Shore since that time. Many homeowners that had no idea what a storm surge was now understand how powerful that force of water can be. It has been devastating for whole communities here along the Jersey Shore. We had 22 homes between this street and this street that either were gone or have to be knocked down or have been knocked down since. Right now, at the Jersey Shore, resiliency to community leaders means getting through the next storm or getting through this summer season or getting their residents back into their homes. It's really critical on a personal level and also on a business level for me to be open Memorial Weekend. Thank you. The natural resources of the Jersey Shore they are critical to the economy, to the livelihood, to the recreation opportunities, and to the huge tourist industry that brings people here all summer and, and fall long. When I talk about resiliency, I'm thinking about a future condition where after the next storm and after 20 years of storms into the future, those communities will still be the same place they are or better because they were built in a more resilient way. I've been here for 30 years. I don't plan on going anyplace. And a lot of people after the storm kind of mentioned, like, why don't you just give up? Why don't you just sell it? Why don't you just move on? And no, I won't do it. I can't give up. I won't give up. <laughs> the tipping point for making a more resilient decision is going to be different for everyone. For many individuals, Sandy may have been their tipping point. For others, it's going to take two or three more storms, and maybe their flood insurance no longer being available to them for it to be their tipping point. They're not rebuilding. This house isn't rebuilding. I believe that house they're knocking down. The next house, they're 80. I don't think they're going to be able to rebuild. The community has started to view the storm at sea level rise differently. It's also been taken seriously by the mayor and council. There's going to be a lot more discussion after the summer is over and more of a uh, comprehensive plan of how to handle it. 
it's a big decision to grapple with on how to deal with climate change. Some people are just at the information gathering stage. Other people are ready to plan for it. And some people are ready to start adapting. Where you see it now, the bottom of the house was a level with the driveway and we decided to go up six feet. We don't want to go through this again. Out of this storm, I think there's been a lot of good that has come out of it. That's really the core of a town when you see how they respond in a, a, in a time of crisis. And this town has really come together. My vision of the future of the Jersey Shore is a dynamic changing area. I think that we are just starting to see how powerful these natural events can be along our coast. People's lives are starting to be affected. Businesses are being affected. The pristine, amazing place the Jersey Shore is, it will still be here, but it will be different than people know it now. We're here to work with them and to understand where they're at, what information they need, and how to help them move forward.